Uh, thank you, Sunil, uh, for that introduction, and kia ora and namaste to everyone online. Um, I actually was also in India, um, as Simon mentioned, as part of the New Zealand trade delegation last year. Um, I have to say it's an incredibly impressive country um, with a very bright future, um, and I know that at Zespri, um, we would very much like to be a part of that. It's a very important market to us. Um, so I've really enjoyed the discussion over the last couple of days. Um, can I also thank Pranav and Simon for sharing your thoughts, um, and can I acknowledge our panelists for agreeing to share your insights today? And also actually for your efforts to build greater ties between India and New Zealand, because as we know, it's not just the role of governments, it's the role of communities and businesses as well. Pranav is not there, so I'm going to throw straight to Esther, um, who, is, um, who, as Sunil mentioned, is actually a former diplomat um, and um, is now a trade expert working in the export sector. So Esther, um, can you please give us your view on what you think are the greatest opportunities presented by you know, COVID-19 disruption and what actually you think it's going to take to realise those opportunities? Kia ora and uh, namaste, and thank you so much for having me uh, here tonight. Can I just um, briefly uh, express my condolences to what India is currently going through? Um, as has been said, I've, um, you know, I spent three years there and have uh, many friends and colleagues still there, and it's been heartbreaking to watch it from afar, so I can only imagine what it's like to, to go through it in person. Um, I uh, am very pleased to be um, part of the India community still uh, back in, in New Zealand. And so it gives me great pleasure to um, be able to speak uh, briefly here on this panel too. So I just wanted to start by giving a, a brief context to our experience um, as a sector in, um, you know, throughout COVID. Uh, so as most businesses experience, the red meat sector um, went through unprecedented disruption and global meat markets and supply chains were severely impacted. But actually, New Zealand red meat exports reached a historic high last year. We exported $9.2 billion worth of product, which was um, a record for us. And our sector navigated these challenges very well um, in comparison to other sectors. In the more immediate outbreak of the pandemic, our exporters faced uh, really two main global trade challenges. Firstly, the supply chain impacts due to port congestion, disruption to air and sea freight, um, as well as distribution networks in the market. And then secondly, the consumption patterns of red meat were significantly affected as lockdown measures uh, globally closed the food service sector, which is a really important part of um, our product offering. Uh, but I think our resilience can be attributed to our diverse market strategy. We export to more than 110 export markets around the world, and also our deep understanding and relationships across our supply chains. And that's already been a theme of, of the discussion uh, today. Um, because these relationships um, and, and understanding allowed our processing and exporting companies to shift product to different countries, but also within markets, and to also pivot to new channels, uh, such as from food, the food service sector to retail and e-commerce. Um, and then secondly, our processing companies showed remarkable agility to be able to reconfigure their operations under covid uh, constraints and to continue to deliver those high quality products that we're famous for in an efficient manner. manner. Um, but New Zealand's reputation for safe and quality food also stood us in really good stead. Um, New Zealand's robust food safety regulations provided New Zealand companies with that competitive advantage um, because food security and food safety became such a grave concern for many countries. And so more than a year um, since the pandemic began, and it's kind of incredible to um, say that, but the global food service still hasn't recovered and supply chain issues continue to be a really significant challenge for exporters. And, um, you know, this is particularly exacerbated for New Zealand exporters, given that we're down at the bottom of the world. Um, initially, the sector faced very few COVID-specific trade barriers, although the risk of trade protectionism really remained a very real and prevalent one. Um, a number of governments turned to protectionism in efforts to guarantee food security. And during this time and since then, we've really valued the New Zealand government's leadership in ensuring trade relationships are strengthened and trading routes remain open for business. 
But as the pandemic has played out and governments seek to contain COVID, but also protect their populations, and also be seen to politically react, there's been a move by some markets to implement really stringent access requirements. And these access requirements have increased costs, uncertainty and complexity to the trading environment. So in order to encourage uh, and support the trade of safe, high quality and nutritious food, um, the trade and rules based system is more important than it has been ever before. It's really critical that our governments continue to argue for science based regulations with trading partners and push back against COVID related regulatory creep that doesn't reflect the latest science or food safety best practice. The importance of multilateral trade rules and global relationships are even more apparent as COVID-19 has provided the world with a case study. Um, this was a really important conversation prior to COVID, but I think it's exacerbated uh, the, the issues at, at play and um, increased the need uh, for progress. Because when crises occur, food security and food safety are at the forefront of political and public concern. We can address and protect against these concerns if we continue to work collaboratively. That means a partnership, of course, between New Zealand and India, but also together internationally through multilateral forums such as the WTO. This is absolutely essential. We have to have rules and regulations that provide robust frameworks for food safety and that ensure the flow of food trade. As COVID demonstrated, protectionism actually does the opposite of what it is intended. Protectionism leads to food insecurity as opposed to food security. So relationships, international collabor collaboration and accountability and science must be the cornerstones of any post-COVID re um, regulation so that we can ensure the flow of safe, high quality and nutritious foodstuffs around the world. I'll leave it there, Michael, thank you. Thank you, Esther, uh, and apologies actually, and sorry, I'll come back to you with that question now, but um, incredibly um, um, insightful analysis, and as you say, really important to focus on um, you know, the, you know, the unexpected impacts of that protectionism and also you know, around um, ensuring food secu security, and particularly for vulnerable communities. Um, but I did want to ask, so just um, just that question I did sort of touch on earlier, but as you know, as a former diplomat, what do you see as the greatest opportunities presented by COVID-19 disruption? And what are your views on what it's going to take to realise those? Um, because it will take some work. Sorry, you said you're on mute. If you could come off mute, please. Sorry. You'd think after more than a year of this, um, I'd be better practised. Um, so, yeah, I think, um, you know, for our export-led sector, the disruption has really been a very crude test for the strengths and weaknesses within our business model and supply chain. And um, as I said in my opening remarks, we had a record year for exports last year, and I think COVID demonstrated our resilience um, that we've built, you know, over many decades throughout the supply chain. And we feel like we're in a very strong position as a producer of um, high quality, safe, nutritious food. Um, and as a consequence, the opportunities are boundless because consumers all over the world have um, been looking much more closely at the provenance of their food, um, sustainability, quality, uh, nutrition, um, as they look to improve their own well-being um, and also align their food choices uh, with their own values. And so I think we are very well placed um, to provide consumers with what they're looking for. But I think too, um, you know, the other side of it and, and, and what we're talking about here today is that robust regulations and frameworks like the ones that we have in New Zealand in, re in relation to food safety, um, animal welfare, environmental standards, these really underpin our product offerings. And that again presents really big opportunities for New Zealand food producers, um, but also for the New Zealand government who works internationally to collaborate with others on these kinds of issues to shape and strengthen capacity, rules, uh, and also the science. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for India and New Zealand to work uh, more closely together on those sorts of issues. 
And thank you, Issa. Thank you, Issa. And can I just echo those uh, your views around you know, what consumers want to see? They want healthy, nutritious products that they can believe in and grow in a way that they can buy into. Um, you know, and they're increasingly focused on their health and well-being. So um, just from this perspective, I echo those sentiments. Um, obviously, one of the ways we are going to um, continue to engage is through the negotiation around trade agreements. So I'm actually going to ask Stephen Jacoby um, to speak now about his views on the future of those agreements. Please, Stephen. Uh, namaskar, kia ora. Uh, thank you, uh, Michael. Thanks to INZBC for the invitation to join you at this panel. Uh, India has been very much on our minds in recent weeks, and um, we extend our condolences uh, to all. Um, uh, so just a few thoughts, perhaps, on the future of trade agreements, and then perhaps what we might be able to do with um, uh, India. Um, uh, one of my favorite quotes that I use far too often is, um, the future ain't what it used to be. In fact, uh, that was a quote from an American baseball player and part-time philosopher, a guy called Yogi Berra. Well, the future ain't what it used to be for trade. And uh, so it won't be the same either uh, for trade agreements. They also will be changing. Uh, in fact, they are changing and they're growing in complexity and coverage, but they're not becoming any easier to launch or conclude. I think we have to ask ourselves, why do we negotiate trade agreements? The answer is absurdly simple. It's to do more trade, but it's amazing how complicated everything becomes uh, after that. Uh, trade agreements are all about the environment against which business and trade are done. They eliminate barriers, they reduce costs, they speed up doing business, and the time to get products, that is goods and services, across borders to consumers. Once they used to focus mostly at the border on tariffs and then non-tariff barriers, today they're very much focused uh, behind the border on a range of policies and regulations. There are new sectors coming on online like digital, the creative economy that need to be taken into account, new issues to do with global supply and value chains, new stakeholders uh, who've got views about things like environment, the climate change, um, labor conditions, and the need to make sure FDAs include the needs of groups like SMEs, um, indigenous people, and women who haven't been included in the past. So you can see it's a very complicated agenda. And actually I foresee it becoming even more complicated as time go on. Uh, now, now, New Zealand has traditionally focused on what we call ambitious, high quality, and comprehensive trade agreements. That's because we're a small player and we need to um, uh, tempt the larger guys with uh, um, a, a broader strategic agenda, particularly as we're already a rather open market. And in, in the case of our um, hugely important relationship with India, where, as I heard yesterday, several speakers say on both sides that there is this desire to expand the economic relationship, uh, it, it is clear that this traditional approach is not going to work in the short term. But I come back to the main point of FTAs. They're only worth doing in the first place if they lead to more trade and more business. But FTAs aren't just the only solution we can bring to bear. With India and with some other partners, we should be thinking about making progress where we can at different levels. And there are a range of things that we can do which may fall short of the goal of an FTA, but when, which when brought together can make a real difference about uh, removing barriers, reducing costs, and speeding up processes. And I'm thinking about things like regulatory cooperation in certain sectors, enhanced trade facilitation, and the application of digital tools to get goods across borders and moving more quickly. I'm thinking of investment facilitation, which we heard about from Deepak Balga yesterday, and which Earl Rattray is very closely associated in. New Zealand is a member of APEC. You see behind me, if you can in fact see it, a banner for the APEC Business Advisory Council, which we are chairing this year. In APEC, there is a wealth of economic cooperation, which has been going on for years, which we can apply more intentionally to the relationship between India and New Zealand. So I hope these are things that as businesses, we can work on together to demonstrate the strong value proposition of enhanced cooperation to our governments. And my friend uh, Bharat Joshi and I have already started a, a conversation about this. And Bharat, it's good to see you uh, uh, on the panel today. So um, Michael, trade agreements are changing. The world is changing. New Zealand still sees value in high quality, comprehensive and ambitious trade agreements. But in the meantime, there are a lot of things that we can do 
uh, with India to boost our economic cooperation. The future ain't what it used to be. And as Deepak said yesterday, tomorrow can be better than today if we work on it. Kia ora. Um, thank you, Stephen, for that. Um, I do wonder, though, what, you know, if we are thinking about the future being different, what's New Zealand going to have to change? Um, you know, ha what, how do we have to change what we seek from trade partners, um, you know, moving away from the full and comprehensive agreements we seek today that, you, that you've discussed? Yes, well, I think we have to start uh, thinking um, uh, longer term about some of these things, uh, and we do have to start thinking differently. It doesn't mean we turn our backs on, uh, on RCEP or on the eventual goal of a of a bilateral free trade agreement by any means. But we need to start thinking about putting in place uh, the building blocks to getting closer to that goal all the time, building confidence, making the sort of relationships uh, that we need to invest in uh, to get to that area. And actually something yesterday uh, that I heard um, uh, that I think is really a, a, around business uh, more for, than, than for governance, uh, for governments, um, we need to be more interested in the global governance that is going on around the world. Obviously in New Zealand at the moment, we're highly focused on APEC, uh, more than we would normally be probably uh, because we're responsible for it. Um, but again, we need to be focusing a lot of attention on these, on these global institutions like APEC, uh, like the G20, like the WTO, and we need to be working out uh, between us what things we can harvest from those uh, um, very large institutions that can be applied to the relationship between us. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, can I throw to you now, please, Mr. Brett Joshi? Um, can I start by saying I have your book at home? Um, and I haven't got to it yet, but I will uh, shortly. Um, but can I please get your thoughts?